Okay, well, hello again. Uh, my name is Ben Rhodes. I'm the Senior Vice President with CAMS. Happy to be bringing you another session of our Ask the Expert series. Uh, what did I volunteer for? The ins and outs of being a board member. This is the second part of a two-part series. So um, last month, Chris talked a little bit about uh, the basics of community governance. And he's gonna get into um, well, the second part, um, touching on all kinds of different things that help will help y'all um, in making board decisions. So as a reminder, um, these sessions are recorded and we do post them on our website. So if you do want to direct any other board members to the website, you can certainly do that. You, they can be found at the board member section of the camsmgt.com. Uh, click on the webinars link and you will see all of the other webinars that we've hosted. There are probably about 18 of them currently sitting on there. So um, lots of great information, um, but uh, we do hope that you will take advantage of the board member resources that we do have on the website. Um, we will be doing a QA. and a um, So at the end of the session, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A function through uh, Zoom and you can ask questions. Um, we are going to try and keep this to an hour tonight, um, and we may run over with questions, but feel free to ask those questions. If we can't get to all, the, all of them, I do apologize. Um, we will try and follow up with uh, any question that we can answer um, offline. But again, thank you for joining, and Chris, I will turn it over to you. Hi, well, thanks, Ben. Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Chris Gellix. I'm with the McIntosh Law Firm. Uh, I practice in the area of community association law. That is uh, about 90% of what I do. All things, including formation, attending meetings, drafting documents, interpretation of litigation, as well as collection. For those of you who uh, attended last month, we went into a discussion of uh, simple board uh, responsibilities, which are fiduciary duty, um, you know, how to run your meetings, things like that. This part two, we're going to get into uh, probably some of the three biggest the three biggest questions that many board members have when you first come to the board. Um, I will tell you uh, to put all this in an hour. We are not going to go very deep, so this will be a thirty thousand foot view from above on these topics. Um, so please keep that in mind. This is also both both North and South Carolina uh, specific. But I, I touch on both. I am admitted in both states. So uh, we'll get into that. Um, let me share my screen. And we will begin. So our roadmap today, uh, one of the main questions I, always, I get from boards uh, when they first come on is, well, how do we change our documents? Some language isn't working right. It's hard to enforce a section, something like that. So we're going to talk about amendment procedures. We're also going to talk about rules and the differences between restrictions and rules and how effective they are and you know, how to enforce them. What are our risks, both the restrictions and the rules? Um, you have fiduciary duty to enforce these things. Um, how you do that and you know, what you should enforce uh, are going to be topics. And we're going to talk about procedures for levering fines, suspending privileges, and how to look reasonable in doing so. Uh, finally, for tonight, we're going to talk about the collection process, both for uh, assessments and fines. Um, and in doing that, we're going to, I'm going to do an overview of the processes in both states. And I say there on, on the slide that they're completely different. They're not 100% different, but where, where you get into past the lean stage, then they are very, very different. So um, that's our roadmap for tonight. If you have uh, questions, please put those in the chat or Q&A box, excuse me. Um, we're gonna have to fly to get to touch on the main topics and then we'll, we'll see how deep we can get in the Q&A. So let's talk about amending your documents. Obviously you get on the board, uh, you guys are in charge of reading them and trying to understand them. Uh, I will tell you, um, you know, for your documents, your restrictions and your bylaws and articles of incorporation and rules and regulations. We talked about the document hierarchy last time, but knowing what's in those documents is important because you need to know what to enforce and how to enforce and what things mean. Um, and if you come across something that you don't like and that needs to be changed, there is a process to amend those restrictions. Uh, I say amending your declaration, you can call them restrictions. If it's a condominium, 
It's your, your condominium declaration. If you're in South Carolina, it can be called your master deed if you're a condominium. Any of those documents, there's a specific procedure set for. In North Carolina, the, the procedure is set forth by statute. Um, if you are a post-1999, January 1, 1999 community, uh, townhome or single family, uh, the declaration can be amended, and this is per the Plan Community Act, the, doc, the, the references I have there, by at least 6 to 7% of the membership. So I don't care what that, if you are a post-1999 community, uh, January 1, 99, your document, your declaration may say you can amend with 60%. I've seen a few that say a majority. Uh, that doesn't matter. The statute always controls, as we discussed last month. Therefore, at a minimum, you need 67% or higher, either by vote or written agreement, to amend your, your restrictions. Uh, if, your doc, if your declaration has a higher percentage, 75%, for example, I've seen that many times. I've seen them as high as 90. Um, the higher percentage controls. So it, it, the 67% applies only if it's silent or if it has uh, less than 67. If you have a higher number, you have to go with that. If you are a pre-January 1, 1999 computer community, good news, this statute applies to you as well. Uh, now that, again, that is for planned communities. For condominiums, if you are a post October 1, 1986 condominium, if you were formed after that date, this is the same procedure, same uh, percentage applies and the same uh, reasoning too, meaning 67 or higher, regardless of what your documents say, if it's a lower percentage, if it's higher, you go with the higher uh, by vote or written agreement. That section in the Condo Act, however, and that's 47C2-117, is not retroactive to pre-1986, October 1, 1986 communities. That means if you are a condominium formed before October 1, 1986, the percentage needed to amend your documents that is contained within your documents controls. That is the only exception. Why the legislature has not made that retroactive, I, don't, I do not know. Um, I will also tell you, um, and I say this applies, if you are a pre-January 1, 1999 community, this, and I, I said that this section applies to you, it applies unless your restrictions specifically say it does not apply. And I have never read a set of, set of restrictions that specifically says that the, the plan of the Community Act does not apply. Therefore, it, it's a pretty safe bet that you need and in North Carolina, if you are a planned community, you need at least 67%. Uh, condominiums, as I said, uh, depending upon your age. And I don't know that I know there are still, I have a few condominium clients that are older than October 1, 86, but not too many. In South Carolina, completely different. There's no statute on point uh, regarding amendments. The declaration language thus controls whatever percentage and procedure is set forth in your restrictions uh, or your master deed controls how you amend. Now, the South Carolina Homeowner Association Act passed in 2018, which is uh, codified at uh, South Carolina Code Title 27, Chapter 30, requires that amendments to these documents, and we all know this, it's in, but you have to record any amendments to your uh, governing documents in South Carolina for them to be enforceable. We know that in North Carolina, if you amend your restrictions, you must record that amendment for it to be effective. In South Carolina, as we will talk on the next couple of slides, anything that you amend, whether it's bylaws or rules, you must record them. Um, so that's, that is a big difference between the two states. In North Carolina, you only need to record an amendment to the declaration. Uh, in South Carolina, you have to record everything uh, for them to be effective. Um, I put a case there at the bottom, Urks, Urkus v. Kasparek. It's a 1990 case out of South Carolina. Um, and I'm going to talk about language here a little bit tonight. Um, there, there are a number of North Carolina cases, uh, Armstrong versus Ledges and uh, Wallach, the Lingle uh, versus Wallach case. And the two North Carolina cases, they're not cited here, but I can get those sites if you'd like to see them, basically say that your amendments have to be reasonable. Um, in South Carolina, uh, I, I put that case there because this is a little story. The master in equity, who is the judge that hears foreclosure cases in South Carolina, specifically in York County, uh, 
until he retired a few years ago, was a, was a judge by the name of Jack Kimball. In 1990, Jack Kimball was an attorney and he argued for the plaintiff in the Urquis v. Casper case and won. He was a, he def, uh, represented an owner in a planned community who challenged the association's ability to not amend the declaration, but to add a restriction. Um, and filed a lawsuit, one, the trial court said yes, to change, to amend your declaration does not mean add, it means change. The case was appealed and he won on appeal. So in South Carolina, uh, what you are change, what you are trying to amend, if you are if you are simply adding something, you could have hit a roadblock if someone challenges it. Now that's a single case. Um, and really, I do think in reading the, the reasoning behind that case, it is more of a reasonableness standard than simply you're adding something. But nevertheless, um, that is a case to be aware of when you are considering amending your documents in South Carolina. Again, amendments in both states. The idea is that the amendment must be have must have some basis in being reasonable. What that means is, for example, if your if your restrictions say that your assessments are to be hundred dollars a month, I um, mean they've been hundred dollars a month for twenty years, and all of a sudden you want to raise them to five thousand a month, that's likely unreasonable, um, simply because of the amount of the increase. That's just one example. Uh, the, the two cases that I, I discussed, one of them had to do with a set of restrictions. This is the Armstrong case, if you've heard of it. The Armstrong case dealt with a set of restrictions that did not contain any mandatory membership in a, in a homeowners association, nor did it have mandatory assessments. The members voted to change that, make membership mandatory and mandatorily assess. And Court of Appeals uh, said no, uh, court, sorry, Supreme Court in North Carolina said no, you can't do that because uh, it was unreasonable. You can't force member, people to join a homeowners association if it's not already in your documents. That's what that case stood for. The underlying principle is reasonable. Amending your bylaws. In North Carolina, there's a, a this is statutorily driven, uh, and that is 55A1021. And it basically says the, the following. The members will can amend the bylaws by either a two thirds of a vote cast at a meeting or a majority of everybody in your community. I went, that can be a little confusing. I went through in my community uh, four years ago and amendments to the bylaws. We were fortunate to get uh, more than half of the community to respond. And of those more than two thirds voted yes. So we were, we, we met those requirements. Note, excuse me, that in North Carolina, when you amend your bylaws, those amendments, unless there is some requirement within those bylaws that says they are to be recorded, they do not need to be. In North Carolina, your bylaws do not need to be recorded at the Register of Deeds anytime. Not amendments, not when they are originally filed. You will sometimes see with condominium documents um, an exhibit to the condominium declaration that contains the bylaws. It may even contain the Articles of Incorporation. Even unless the, the declaration or the bylaws those specifically say the amendments must be recorded, you do not have to record those amendments. Now, I advise it if your bylaws are recorded, but if they're not, there's really no, there's no statutory requirement that that be done. And, and understand the recording, if you do record them, if they're required to be recorded somewhere in the documents, they are not effective until recording in the Register of Deeds. South Carolina, a little bit different. And this is South Carolina Code 2730 1021. Allows the bylaws to be amended by the board. North Carolina, the board must approve the amendment first and then the members vote, as I outlined there a second ago. South Carolina, that section says the bylaws may be amended by the board unless the Articles of Incorporation reserve the bylaw amendment power to members or the members adopt a bylaw amendment and provide that the board cannot amend it. So it's a lot, it's, it's easier to amend in South Carolina because the bylaws uh, can be amended by the board. But understand that that amendment must be recorded in South Carolina for it to become effective. If it's not recorded, it cannot be enforced if there's any, whatever you're amending. And, you know, if you're dealing with, for example, meeting notices, uh, every bylaw, all your bylaws should have your annual meetings, special meetings, your notices, your proxies, if you're amending language like that, 
and don't record it, there is a possibility that if you if it's a meeting issue and you follow an unrecorded amendment procedure set forth in the, in the bylaws um, and hold your meeting, there's an argument that a member because uh, could say, well, you didn't record that bylaw amendment that changed the meeting notice requirements, for example, and therefore that amendment is not valid and the procedure that you used following that amendment to call the meeting is also not valid. So it's very important that you record the amendments to the bylaws. Likewise, in rules, rules, and, rest rules and restrictions, uh, rules are not restrictions. Um, in North Carolina, boards may adopt rules pursuant to the Condominium Act and the Planned Community Act, and that's 3102, uh, 47F, 47C3102. Um, boards can adopt rules regarding what can go on on common elements, common area, and if allowed for in the declaration, boards could potentially adopt rules that govern what a person does or doesn't do on their lot. In South Carolina, there is no statute that allows boards to make rules. So the power to make rules has to be either written in the restrictions or bylaws or it must be inferred in some fashion by the language in the, those bylaws or uh, declaration. Understand this, and this is, this is not a procedure thing, this is just a language thing. Rules do not equal restrictions. Restrictions always control over the rules because rules can be generally changed by the board without a member vote. Restrictions are always re, uh, amended by the members. And that is the big distinction regarding enforceability. Rules that conflict with the restrictions will not be able to be enforced. Restriction language always controls. Rules that are consistent with the restrictions can be enforced, assuming they were adopted pursuant to proper procedures. So that is a, a key. And what do I mean by rules? If, you, if your declaration allows you to assign, allow, if your condominium allows you to uh, assign parking spaces, if you adopt a rule assigning certain, space, certain parking spaces to certain individuals, that's perfectly acceptable. The rule allow, the restriction allows you to do that. On the other hand, unless there is something in your restrictions that allows you to do to pass a rule regarding what someone could do on their lot, then someone coming out and putting a, uh, a sprinkler head on their property or perhaps doing a dance on their property or having parties on their front lawn, um, it's not something that you can pass rule to restrict because your restrictions don't allow you. So just keep in mind the, the length and breadth of your rules is governed by what your restrictions will allow. The power to make rules in North Carolina is, by, is given to you by statute. Your documents may expand that to do to allow you to make rules of what, what happens on a lot. In South Carolina, it is completely document driven. When we're talking about rules and restrictions, we naturally must move on to enforcement. Enforcement meaning someone's violating these restrictions or somebody's violating the rules. You're not allowed to have a clothesline on the property and somebody puts a clothesline. Not allowed to have an above ground pool. Somebody builds an above ground pool in the front yard. What do we do? Well, the purpose, what's the purpose of enforcement? What's the purpose of taking remedial action? The board sees this violation. They get a complaint from owners. What is their purpose? The purpose is to achieve compliance by the offending owner. It's not to teach them a lesson. And the quote, that'll teach them is on there for a reason. I was in a board meeting some nine years ago. On this board, it was a condominium uptown. On this board was a uh, very well-read, well-versed attorney, uh, but he didn't do HOA law. And there was a violation, alleged violation of a leasing restriction within the, within the condominium. After much debate, he, they, the, associate, the board decided to fine the individual uh, set amount and to do that per day until the leasing violation was cured. In the meeting, the secretary was taking down the minutes, but she basically recorded everything that was said. And the president, who was this attorney, said, after the levy of the fine, said, well, that'll teach you. That got written down by the secretary. I had to tell her to redact it. 
the, the point of enforcement is not to teach the owners a lesson, it is to get compliance. And the further statement was made at that meeting, we were elected so we can do what we want with these violations. That again is not the point. The point is to get compliance, to get the violation cured. Now, what's your fiduciary duty? We talked about fiduciary duty last month. You have a fiduciary duty to enforce the restrictions and the rules. If you're not going to enforce something, then you need to change the restrictions. I get questions from boards all the time. You know, well, this there's this uh, parking rule that we don't enforce. Um, can, you know, is, is that a problem? Yes, it's a problem because it's in the restrictions. You have a duty to review those restrictions and to enforce those. And if you can't enforce it, then there needs to be some action taken, if possible, to change the restrictions to remove it or to make it more enforceable. I get this all the time. It's just not possible to enforce it because we don't have the manpower. Okay, then we need to change the restrictions and we need to get, and, and if we can't change the restrictions, that means the membership wants, to, if you can't vote to take it out, then the membership must like it enough that they want it enforced. That's kind of the reason. Now, every situation is different and it may be impossible to get the vote together to change the restrictions to take out the stuff you're not enforcing. But it is my opinion that a restriction is in there to be enforced if it's an enforcement type restriction. Therefore, it is your duty to take steps if you can to enforce it. Uniformity in enforcing is paramount. No favoritism. If somebody is putting a pool in their front lawn and another one is doing it next door, you enforce uniformly against both. But it's also, you have to be reasonable. Um, I get this a lot. Of, we, we see this a lot when we deal with leasing restrictions and leasing violations. Uh, owners going through a hardship have to lease in order to keep their house. They can't pay their mortgage without the rental income. I get it. Um, I talk with boards about this all the time. It is possible, unless there is a, a, a prohibition against variances, unless it, you know, you, you usually try to work something out with those people. But understand your first and foremost duty is, is to enforce and doing so uniformly and be reasonable in doing so. Those are the, those are the big things that always get boards in trouble. Favoritism, enforcing one, something against one person and not against the other. I, my, my advice always is, if you're going to enforce something against person A, but not against person B, then document as much as possible why you're not in Fort Weiss, why the situation with person B is different than A. If you do that, then you, one, you've preserved your reasoning, and two, if the reasoning is due to these, the board taking in all factors, all considering everything it's got, it has in front of it, you look reasonable. You look like you are caring about your community and you're not looking authoritarian. I'm going to put the hammer down on these people all the time. So it is a fine line to walk. There is no set, always enforce here, never enforce here type rule because every situation is different. I don't care what it is. I don't care what we're talking about um, because if one person is violating something and another person is violating something, it may be the exact same violation, but they are two different people, two different households, and likely two different sets of circumstances. So it's an individual review with a underlying, uh, underlying thought of being uniform in how you enforce. Violations of covenants and rules in North Carolina. They are generally governed by 47F or 47C, 3107.1 and 3102.11 and 12. Basically says, if you don't have a process set forth in your restrictions on how to deal with violations, then before you take remedial action, and I say remedial action, that is by levying a fine or suspension of privileges, privileges provided by the association, pool access, I have a couple of associations that provide water, water shutoffs. Yes, that is a thing. Um, you have to have a hearing before you levy such uh, fine or suspend privileges. If the statutes, that's 47F3107.1 specifically, 
provides that if your covenants provide a process, then that process is can be followed. Your process and your restrictions may not require a pre fine or suspension hearing. It may be, and I've seen this quite a bit, where the owner gets a violation letter saying you're in violation, you got 10 days to cure, we're going to love you fine. And if you wish to have a hearing, request one. Okay. According to the statute, that's probably acceptable because it is a process set forth in your documents. I will tell you, however, that due process is favored, meaning if for some reason the decision to find in that circumstance is challenged, it is, there is a tendency for courts to favor pre fine and suspension hearings, meaning give them notice, give them an opportunity to be heard before you make your decision. I have no, I know of no case in North Carolina that says uh, levying the fine, but giving them an opportunity to be heard is not acceptable. What I am saying is that due process before levying your, your penalty is preferred by courts. Communicate with your owners during these things. If you send them a hearing notice and you talk with them, they come to the hearing, explain the fine and suspension process to them. It is great if you, if you publish such process to the community and revisit it periodically, whether it's in a newsletter or on the website. If you have graduated fines, meaning, for example, on the first violation, it's $5 a day, the second violation, it's 10, for the third is 50, and the fourth, is whatever. Um, publish those. Let the association members know what, what the penalties are. Um, uniform enforcement, again, is very, is, is needed because what we don't want to, we want to appear reasonable, we don't want to appeal arbitrary and capricious. I don't want to stand up in court and have to defend a decision by a board that's not documented and just appears like they don't like you and therefore they, they levied a $100 fine when they levied a $5 fine for somebody else. Courts hate that and that is one of the biggest areas where you'll be challenged. Self-help language in a declaration can be a trap. What do I mean by self-help? Language in your declaration that says that the association board of directors observes a violation upon reasonable notice they have the right to remedy the situation by entering on the property and curing the violation and then charging the owner for the cost of that cure. I see that all the time. Um, that can be a trap. Um, discussed this way too many times uh, through the years regarding, uh, you know, a, a case where someone, uh, an association went on to someone's lot to cut the grass because it was going, it was too high and they chopped off the prized tomato plant. Uh, a lot of my colleagues talk about that case. Um, that's one of the dangers. I encourage self-help in the situation where you have a court order saying you can go on a property. Other than that, uh, while that self-help language may be in there, I don't know if I've ever issued a legal, legal opinion that says go do it. It's possible I may. Um, it depends on the situation. But in my opinion, the language in the statute is there to give boards the opportunity to take administrative action to cure violations and define and suspension the privileges process. And that is, to my, in my opinion, and I believe the court would back up, back me up on this. Uh, that is the preferred method. If it's vague, it's not enforceable. Uh, ben and I were having a discussion, I think about this case, um, we were talking pr prior to starting, regarding nuisances. Harrison versus Land's End case is an unreported case in 2010. Uh, language in the declaration required uh, the lot owners to keep their, uh, their lots uh, well-maintained uh, and no unsightly uh, conditions had to be clean. And uh, if it was not, if it was unsightly, uh, if it was not well-maintained, it was continuing nuisance. Uh, an owner on a piece of property down in Emerald Island, down at the beach, allowed a basically a swamp to go on their property. The association tried to take remedial action. There was a lawsuit and the result was the court examining the very language I put there for you to see and says the following. It's vague. I don't know what clean and cycling means. I don't know what a continuing nuisance means. What does well-maintained mean? Because those terms are subjective based upon whoever is reading them. We cannot enforce it. And therefore, the language is void and unenforceable. So be aware when you take action based upon language and your restrictions or rules that you've adopted. If the language 
is not objective, you could run into a situation where you could be challenged because the language is vague. It is vitally important to speak with an attorney like myself, speak with your manager about specific, if you have questions about whether the language is enforceable. Uh, we are a half hour in, I'm gonna move along here. Violations in South Carolina, there is no statutory process, none. Going, I wanna say one more thing about North Carolina. You also always have the ability to seek injunctive relief and sue the owner to cure a violation. Someone builds an addition onto their house, for example. Uh, this is a case out of Mecklenburg County from a number of years ago. Builds an addition onto the house, didn't seek architectural approval. The association knew that if they pursued the fine process, it wasn't gonna get them anywhere because all they were gonna do is levy fines, but the addition on the house that was unapproved was still there. They sought injunctive relief, the court ordered, the addition on the house be removed. The courts will do that because there was specific language in the restrictions that required approval before any construction could occur. They didn't get it. And therefore the board was justified in pursuing uh, a, uh, a legal remedy and the court issued an injunction and required that owner to remove the addition of the house and seek approval before it was rebuilt. That was a great case. In South Carolina, there's no statutory process. I say here, there is always an ability to sue and enforce. Every set of restrictions I've read in South Carolina contains the ability for the association and every set in North Carolina too, for the association to take action via court relief, if you seek, it and just seek injunctive relief. The question has been posed, though, well, what if that's not in a document in South Carolina? My opinion is you still have the ability because owners have the right to enforce restrictions against other owners and association would also have that right. It would just have to sue for whatever that is. But then the next question is, are you gonna sue an owner because he or she leaves trash can out? That's a big problem in South Carolina. If you do not have a fine process set in your restrictions in South Carolina, what do you do when you have a chronic owner who simply leaves a trash can out? or it could be viewed, or uh, commits some other violation that would be easily to, to find for to correct the issue. Are you gonna sue them every time? It's just not practical. A lawsuit costs $20,000 nowadays just to get filed and get running. Um, if it's vague, again, same standard in, in South Carolina. If your restrictions if that you're trying to enforce or your rule trying to enforce is vague, it's gonna be unenforceable. If the documents are silent, as to a fine and suspension process, then you cannot fine or suspend them. I had an association in South Carolina with a very knowledgeable manager last year discuss with me why, you know, trying to collect on unpaid fines for this owner. And when I reviewed the documents, I didn't see a fine process. And I asked the manager about it. And her response was, well, I just assumed there was one because we could do it in North Carolina. And eh, can't do that. In South Carolina, there is no statute in place allowing you to fine or suspend. Therefore, it, it has to be in your documents. If it's not in there, you cannot fine and you cannot suspend for violations. You're going to need to amend your documents to assert, insert that language in there. I'm going to give you a war story on enforcement. I represent an association in North Carolina. You see that picture there, that is a gravel road. Um, that is not the gravel road I'm talking about, but it is illustrative. There was a, it's a community in, in North Carolina that is in an air park. When the owner in 2002 built the lot, built on the lot, there was construction traffic uh, and they came up the side of the lot. And over the course of about the year they were building that, that house and another structure, ruts began to form. Uh, where they kept going over the same area and it went from the road all the way back to the house. Uh, ruts would form and then uh, uh, as fate would have it, a gravel truck came in and spilled a lot of gravel along that whole uh, gravel driveway is what I'm calling it. it probably went five, 600 feet or more. It's probably more than that. Um, and so over the course of years, that gravel driveway just sat there with the gravel on it, trees overgrew it. Um, it really, and, and of course there was a regular driveway also constructed concrete and everything on there. Um, the restrictions said, there's only two driveways you can have a driveway, and only two, two forms, I'm sorry, three, asphalt, concrete, or brick. You can't have a gravel or a dirt driveway. 
That driveway in 2002 was formed by the ruts of the construction traffic going over the, over the land and the gravel. And it sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there for eight years, eight years. No one said anything. It, again, there were trees overgrowing it so you could see it, but it was just there. New owner buys it in 2010. Um, some, an owner across the street from the new buyer says, hey, you're going to get rid of that gravel driveway. They, the new owner says, no, it was there when I bought it and went to the board and asked for a letter of compliance, meaning we wanted something in writing that says that his lot, even though that gravel driveway was there, was in compliance with the restrictions. Board didn't do anything. Didn't say yes, didn't say no. This went on for another six years. The owner was trying, was getting ready to sell it. And he wanted some statement that said he was not in violation because that gravel driveway was there. Now, query, why you would want something that looks like that on your lot, I don't know. I wouldn't, but again, everyone's different. The board would not give it to him. In fact, sent him a letter at that point and said, no, and not only are we not gonna give you that letter, you're in violation for this gravel driveway that has been there since 2002, this is now 2015. They called him to a hearing and, that, and at that point they called me and attempted to find him. I said, whoa, wait a minute. How long has it been there? How long have you known about it? Um, got, that, got that whole history and as we were working that out, the owner decided, you know what, I'm just gonna sue the HOA. And we ended up having to go to court over that in a five day jury trial, five days. Ended up where the court, the jury in the case found that yes, the owner was in violation of the restrictions because the gravel driveway was on the property, but that the board should have taken action way back in 2002, 2003, 2004, and should not have waited all of that time. And therefore they could not enforce the restriction. The moral of that story is when you find out about the violation, you need to take the steps to enforce it. And if it's something that you should have known about, I'll give you an example. This very case, you drive by, you can see, I saw the pictures, you're driving by this lot, you can see the gravel driveway right there. Everybody in the community can see. The board took no action. There's the, and so they're left with the, 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 ju the judge basically made the legal ruling that they've waived their right to enforce it. And I think rightfully so. The other part of that is, of course, that it would have cost the owner of the property about thirty to forty thousand dollars to concrete it over to make it a valid driveway. Instead, he paid his lawyer $60,000 to keep the other side of the gravel driveway, which I thought, well, that's a moral victory for me. At least we'll be able to spend $60,000. The association spent 60, but it was through the insurance company. So moral of the story, enforce it when you know about it or when you should have known about it. And if you don't, if you're, and if you're getting complaints from owners, you need to look at those um, and not delay. We don't want to deal with a situation where the association didn't enforce in a timely fashion. Let's go on to collections, the last big topic for tonight. I sat on my board of directors for my HOA for four years. I, I, my term ended in January. Um, I'm still popping champagne bottles. For that. But I don't like dealing with collections. People, there are, there are various reasons why people don't pay their assessments. As board members, we know that we need that money. For the necessary operation of the association, we have to have it. We budget for a set amount of assessments to come in. And it's my opinion and other attorneys that do what I do is opinion that you have a fiduciary duty as a board to collect the assessments from everybody. When, met, when you budget, it is natural and you should budget for some percentage of non-payment uh, unless you have a perfect payment record throughout the history of your association, which I've never seen. There are going to always be people that don't pay or at least don't pay time. Um, it, it, it's, it's the nature of the beast of being a board member that you have to deal with these things. In North Carolina, um, you, and you're dealing with, the, again, the collection process when someone doesn't pay is, is statutory. That's 47F or 47C3-116. In, in, in South Carolina, there is no specific collection statute. 
the HOA Act that we I discussed earlier, Title 27, Chapter 30 of the South Carolina Code, does talk about a budget process, much like North Carolina, where you have to adopt the budget, uh, you have to publish it, et cetera. It's not the same process, but the, that's about the only thing that addresses collections. But there's other, so you have the two state laws that you deal with, but there's also federal law that governs what you do when you go to collect assessments. You have the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. In North Carolina, you have the state collection. Um, there's also a South Carolina. And something that I thought was naturally a part of the FDCPA, but it's worth mention, mentioning, is the CFPD. And that is the, oh goodness, I forgot the name of it now. It's a uh, congressional funding something, but it's a, it's another, it's a regulation part of the FDCPA. And then we're dealing with, with fair debt, we're dealing with the, the language that you see on letters. Uh, this is a, this is a an attempt to collect the debt. Anything will be, uh, you, any information obtained will be used for that purpose. That's what's called, we call mini Miranda. And this affects debt, debt verification letters too. It affects all our communications. You know, the, the, our HOAs themselves, debt collectors, not under the federal statute, but the management companies are. And under state statute, you are. So, uh, you have to you have to be aware of how what collection activity you take um, is governed by both state and federal law. And what are your options if someone doesn't pay their assessments? We can do nothing, but that's not viable because you need the money because you budgeted for it. You have a set amount of expenses that need to be paid. And remember what I said: you have a fiduciary duty. Well, so doing nothing is not an option. Well, what's the next option? In both states, you have the power to place a lien on the property if they don't pay and pursue foreclosure through the power sale provision in North Carolina or judicial foreclosure in South Carolina. And that process has been described as killing a fly with a cannon. And here's why. If your assessments are $2,000 a year and they don't pay this year, you put a lien on it. Does anyone really want to foreclose on a $500,000 house for $2,000? Well, no, no one does. It is an extreme method. Um, and then the questions arise, well, what if there's a mortgage on the property? Do we have to pay it? No. If you, if you foreclose on the property, the association takes title. There's no requirement that you pay the mortgage. But uh, the mortgage, the bank could then foreclose on top of you. So that's always a concern. And what about the cost? The power of sale uh, process, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, is not that expensive. In North Carolina, the, for an uncontested foreclosure, start to finish through lien, there's a statutory cap on attorney's fees. Um, there are set costs. Uh, if it's judicial foreclosure, but I'll explain the difference here in a minute, um, it, the costs are going to be higher. Um, so there are, there are costs involved, and you will have to front those, at least some of those, uh, and in the hopes that you'll collect those. Now, I will tell you, if you put a lien on and the owner gets a copy of that lien and you want to pay, you know, the costs that you incur, attorney's fees and assessments will all be collected if they reinstate. So you will collect every penny that you are owed. So that's the second process. It's effective. It is the most effective process that, that I have seen. Um, I think our collection rates now are close to 90% if not over that, which is very good. Um, but it's not the only process. The next process is where you could file a complaint. You could sue them for money, which would seek a money judgment. That's really not that effective though, and here's why. If I sue someone for, on behalf of an association uh, for money, let's say they owe $2,000, the judge may very well sign a judgment that, grant, that awards the association $2,000. What do I have when I have that award? I have a piece of paper that says I'm on money. It doesn't collect it for me. I then have to go through a separate process where I have to have, I have to ask for property to be seized and sold. Owners who uh, wish to dispute that can exempt certain property. And it is a very timely, time consuming process. And it can get expensive and if the owner doesn't pay, you're never going to get that money back and you have nothing to show for it. You wouldn't even get titled to a house in that, uh, in that way. So I have found that method. I know a few associations that pursue that. Uh, I see a lot of, a lot of that go in small claims court. You can pursue that, but what you're going to get is a piece of paper with no one with, with 
additional steps then to take to try to get paid. And the last of the, the options for associations is to hire collection agents. Well, what's a collection agency do? For a fee, they'll say, lend, send letters and make phone calls. If the owner doesn't pay, you still either then have to go back to either put a lien and foreclose or file a complaint and get a money check. So I, in my opinion, a collection agency for HOA assessments is not very effective. There are some that swear by it, and I think that's great. Uh, from my, posi my position on this, and I think the position of most of my colleagues in this, is that the most effective method and the, and the most cost-efficient method, method is the lien foreclosure process. While it can be deemed extreme, it is extremely successful. So let's talk about the South Carolina lien foreclosure process first. There is no statute in South Carolina that tells you how to lien and foreclose on a piece of property, whether it's from, uh, for, for HOA assessments. Your documents control everything. When, if, every, if you read your documents, your Declaration of Covenants, your Master Deed, you will see every, every set of documents I've ever read has in it a provision that allows you to levy assessments and that those assessments, if unpaid, become a lien, which can be foreclosed upon. Okay, so the documents create the power to place a lien if someone doesn't pay. And the lien that gets filed by my office and all and those of us who do this, I've never seen one that didn't, secures the amount then due and all sums coming due. In South Carolina, there's no requirement that you send a letter prior to placing the lien, what we call a pre-lien letter. In North Carolina, it's different. Um, and foreclosure process in South Carolina is a full-blown lawsuit, meaning we draft a complaint. We file it with a summons with the clerk of court. That summons is then given to a sheriff who goes to the property and hands it to the owner or owners. If that's unsuccessful, we can pursue uh, service through um, uh, certified mail. Um, attorney's fees in South Carolina, if they are reasonable or recovered, recoverable, if allowed for in the declaration. There's no statute that, that allows recovery specifically. They must be allowed for in the declaration and they must be reasonable. And by the way, who determines what's reasonable attorney's fees? The judge, not me, not you. Uh, once the judgment is entered, the judgment allows for recovery of money and allows the master in equity, and we're talking in York County specifically, and in most counties in South Carolina, the master in equity then sells the property at a set date and time. If there is a bidder or a high, if there's a, a third party bidder, that person takes the property to sale, otherwise it goes back to the association. That is a synopsis of the foreclosure process. The filing of the lien is pretty straightforward. When someone is delinquent, a lien gets placed, again, securing that amount due and then all sums coming due. 30 days passes and they don't pay, you can proceed to the foreclosure process. There is no statutory cap in South Carolina on what attorney's fees can what, what the costs are and attorney's fees for uh, judicial foreclosure. Again, it is determined, whatever is determined reasonable. I have never had one of my attorney's fee affidavits in a, in a foreclosure matter in South Carolina overturned. Nevertheless, be aware that what I think is reasonable and what you think is reasonable may not be what a judge thinks is reasonable. North Carolina, it's a pretty same process with the lien, but after that, it's, it's completely different. This is completely statutory driven and it's again through 47 FEC 3116. If your documents are silent regarding the lien language, I the statute says that you can put a lien on for unpaid assessments. Now I wouldn't wanna see it in your documents, but nevertheless, uh, if the documents don't necessarily contain the lien language, the statute still allows you to do it. If the assessment, the language in South North Carolina is if an assessment remains unpaid for 30 days, there is an automatic lien. That lien must be filed. It was just much in South Carolina. We draft the lien and we file it with the clerk of court. That immediately puts it on record for the whole world to see. In North Carolina, prior to filing the lien, there must be a 15 day, what we call pre-lien letter. You can't get your attorney's fees without it. The statute clearly says that. If you don't send the 15 day pre-lien letter, all the attorney's fees incurred in pursuing the lien foreclosure process, you're going to eat those. So every management company, I know CAMS does this, sends out the 15 day pre-lien letter and doesn't send it to my office until more than 15 days have passed. That 15 day letter tells an owner the following, here's the debt, here's what you owe. If you do not 
pay within 15 days is going to be referred to my office and you're going to incur attorney's fees. That's basically what that letter says. So it puts them on notice that the costs are going to go up if they don't pay within 15 days. If they don't pay after the lien, you can foreclose if the assessment remains unpaid for 90 days. Meaning if they didn't pay on January 1, we are now on February 17th. So we're 47, 48 days into the year. Uh, you may have put a lien on at the beginning of February for unpaid January assessment, but you can't foreclose until that assessment is 90 days past due. So the Earl on a on a debt that's due on an assessment that's due January 1, you could not begin foreclosure proceedings until April 2nd or thereabouts, whatever 90 days is. The lien can go on after 30. The foreclosure cannot commence until 90. In North Carolina, we have two processes to foreclose. The main one is called a power of sale, which is a non-judicial or quasi-judicial process in front of the clerk. This is never goes in front of a judge. It's, it's the foreclosure process is institute, it starts with a notice of hearing, which gets filed after with a copy of the lien. Um, there is a trustee appointed. Uh, that's a little quirk in the North Carolina law. Um, if I uh, act in my, if I'm counsel for the association, I become trustee in the foreclosure matter and proceed with the filing of the documents and going to the hearing. Now, this is for unpaid assessments. If the power of sale provision occurs, we can be file the lien with, and file a foreclosure. After we file the foreclosure, we could potentially have a hearing within 30 days from filing and sell the property potentially within 21 days of the order. A complete foreclosure could potentially be start to finish complete but within 120 to 150 days from the date the debt becomes delinquent in North Carolina. Conceivably, those time frames are uh, aggressive and I would never see them hit, but that's the possibility. South Carolina, no, never go that fast because you have to file a lawsuit. That usually takes at least three, four months because you have to allow the owner time to answer. If the debt in North Carolina, however, consists solely of fines imposed by the association or interest on unpaid fines or attorney's fees incurred in pursuing the fines, you cannot use the quick 120 to 150 day process in North Carolina. You must file a lawsuit just like you would in South Carolina where you have to draft a complaint, you have to serve, you have to give them time to answer. Um, now, my opinion is if the assessment, if the delinquent amount consists mostly of fines that you, that courts, court, court clerks in North Carolina do not like to foreclose on fine, on where fines are a majority or most of what is owed. So keep that in mind. And, and, and while we have a statutory process in North Carolina that is uniform, every clerk's office is different. There's 101 counties in North Carolina and most of them do about a little bit different. Same way in South Carolina, the, the courts are different in each county. So to summarize a little bit how fast this works, um, you get your pre-lean letter sent to my, if, if, you're, if I'm representing you, uh, you get the pre-lean letter. Once that expires, it's sent to my office. Filing a lien is the practice of law in North Carolina uh, and in South Carolina. We do a quick search of tax records, which we're required to do for North Carolina. And indeed, we look for any other foreclosures, IRS, and if there's any bankruptcies. I hope everyone knows that if someone, if an owner has filed bankruptcy, all collection activity must cease. That is called a stay. You can get relief from that stay, but you have to ask permission and there has to be specific reasons. Uh, we do the same type of search in South Carolina for South Carolina cases. We file the lien, assuming that there's no, no issues with the first two parts there. After that, this is where the, the process differs between these two states. If the debt's 98 days old in South Carolina, we appoint me as a trustee and we vote, to, we, we come to you as a board. We ask you to, to vote to foreclose on a specific property. The vote to foreclose on a specific property is not required in South Carolina. I know most management companies require it and I think it's fine. It's a good way to check and make sure you're following your internal processes and that the board is on board, is, is an agreement to foreclose on a piece of property. In South Carolina, we can serve via uh, certified mail, sheriff, and posting. That's one of the big differences in North Carolina. North Carolina, if it's a power of sale foreclosure process, the sheriff can go stick it on the door. They don't have to hand it to them, the lawsuit to the owners. If it's through the power of sale, if it's a lawsuit, if it's foreclosing on fines, and if you, or if you're in South Carolina, it still has to be per, per, um, 
personal service. You have to hit the judge, the court, the sheriff has to hand it to them. In the power of sale process in North Carolina, you can have a hearing sometimes between 45 and 75 days after the lien is filed. South Carolina, you're not going to go that fast. Properties can be sold at, at, in North Carolina after the order is entered, no earlier than 21 days after the hearing where the order is signed. So we could go to from order to sale in less than a month in North Carolina. In South Carolina, from judgment to sale, it can be about Three, week, three to four weeks. We have to have time to publish. That is one of the other processes here, which I'm not going to get in depth into. But when this property is foreclosed on and you go to sale, you have to publish in the local newspapers. Once the property is sold in both jurisdictions, the deed into the new owner and final report and accounting is complete, usually takes at least about a month, 20 to 30 days. So this is just my uh, little, little, uh, Law according to Chris. Have a standard policy procedure and stick to it. And what, I, what do I mean by that? If you are, if you have a policy that says when someone is 30 days behind, we're going to send them a warning letter. And then we give them another 30 days and then we send a second warning letter. And then if they don't, then we send the pre-lean and foreclose. If that's your standard policy, then stick to it. If you want to change the policy, then change the policy. Don't deviate it without changing it. Document what you're changing, document what your policy is, and tell your members. Um, you know, if they're 30 days behind, if, if you want to move quick, though, if you want to be consistent with the statute, when they're 30 days behind, send, have the association, have the management company send a pre lien letter. If you don't, you don't necessarily, if you send a pre lien letter today and it says we're going to send it to the, we could send it to the attorney within 15 days, there's no requirement that you send it to the attorney within 50, after 15 days. But it puts the owner on notice that, hey, uh, I better do something or I'm going to rack up more fees here and I don't want to do that. I certainly don't want to pay the attorney. Um, that letter results in a lot of payments, um, as does filing the lien. I would say the majority of payments we receive are, are at the lien filing stage, more than a majority. Hit your timelines. Instruct your, and instruct your managers, uh, you know, talk with your managers about how we hit those timelines, whether it is sending a pre-lean le letter out at the precise time, sending it to the attorney at the expiration, making sure the attorney files the lien timely. My office policy is we file a lien within 72 business hours of getting in the request, unless there is a problem. Um, and for heaven's sakes, the foreclosure process is there for a reason. Don't be afraid to file it. Again, I get it. No one wants to sit on a board and foreclose on $2,000. I get it. But that is the most effective way to get collection. And if you simply sit on the lien in North Carolina, if you file a lien, it's good for three years and then it expires. You have to file another one. In South Carolina, they last forever. But if you just sit on it and don't take action, other members of the community will know what you're doing and what you're not doing. And it's that, and, and if, the, if the members of the community do not think you're serious about proceeding with collection process, then, then you're not going to get, you're going to get more non-compliance than you want. And no one wants to sit here and have to talk about that's owed. Uh, one of my pet peeves, and I know it's a lot of the pet peeves from managers and other attorneys. Once the account is with the attorney, don't talk to the debtor. Managers, I know don't. But boards should not either. I get, I get requests a lot. Owners want to talk to the board. No, you're talking to me. Here's why. You talk to the board. Your board doesn't know the exact amount due because there's fees, there's costs tacked on what the assessments are. There's late fees, there's interest. You could quote them something, and if they pay it based upon what you said you'd accept, guess what? You have to accept it. And if it's less than what's owed, you're going in the hole. And... That's the time when I get a call from the manager, the board accepted $400 less than what was owed Would I cut my attorneys. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for bringing me into the decision-making process. Uh, you were hired me to do this and then you kept me out of it and you want me to cut my fee for filing the lien and all that. Now, most of the time I will, uh, but if it gets repetitive, I won't. And I know other attorneys think the same way. You hire us to handle this, let us handle it. And, you know, if someone wants to settle for something and they want, they want interest knocked off or they want late fees off, off, locked off or they want a payment plan, 
we'll talk to you about that. We'll let you guys make the decision, but it's got to go through us so we all have the amount, same amounts ready. Um, last slide. So who do you foreclose on? You foreclose on the picture on the left who owes $10,000 to your association hasn't paid in years, or do you owe the house that's occupied, do you collect on the house that's occupied? Everyone's gonna say you're heartless if you collect the, uh, you don't have a heart if you collect on the one that, that's occupied. But here's the difference. If you have an owner occupied unit, they care about their house, most likely. They care about keeping it. They are more likely to pay and more likely to try to make arrangements to pay than an abandoned house, the one on the left, that owes an exorbitant amount of money you can't find the other. You may take title to that property on the left and then lose it to the bank. The one on the right, you most likely get paid. That's food for thought um, and strategy going forward. We are at the question stage and I will stop sharing my screen. This, this is my information. There's my phone, office phone number. I'm Chris at MacintoshLawFirm.com. My paralegals are Kate uh, at Macintosh and Dustin does my collections. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over back to you, Ben. So, excellent. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm glad you said it at the end. The two things I always talk about with the Fair Debt Collection Act is one, no two parties cannot collect the same debt, right? And so you said, you know, let you handle the collection. Generally, when the attorney's involved, we stop um, handling that collection. So yes. um, the other is don't communicate debt. Right. So, so don't, you know, that you don't publish names, don't, um, you know, send a list out to the community. Don't do anything around that because you can get in, in big trouble for doing that. So. I, I would say it, the, the biggest violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act by homeowners associations is talking to the wrong people about the debt. And no one has ever said no court has ever appreciated public shaming. So uh, <laughs> you, you, you run down that road. And oh, one other thing, folks, especially I see this in small communities. Uh, directors will call me, can I just go knock on the door and talk to them? No, don't do that. One, they don't know who you are. You're inviting trouble. Two, you're gonna knock to, on their door and tell them they owe money. That's not a good idea. Let me handle that. We're, you know, we're, we're trained, we got people trained to handle it. Your, your managers are trained to handle that. Um, I don't think I, it, it's not my policy to to recommend that member board members do that. OK, well, I know we said we were going to keep this to an hour. Um, we are officially right just over an hour. Um, we do have a number of questions that um, so Fine. I'll say for those of you that want to leave the webinars, we'll say officially over. But we do have a number of questions that we'll get through um, probably go for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, depending on your time, Chris. So sure. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, very aggressive uh, on your hearing or foreclosure process, um, 120 to 150 days is... Um, that's uh, pie in the sky time. <laughs> so, yes. That's, a, that's not, the know, norm, it, not the norm. I used to do, I used to do bank foreclosures and banks uh, were, were uh, very, very uh, aggressive with their time. Homeowners Association uh, foreclosures... Uh, you know, one, clerks don't like them. And two, um, nobody's moving that fast now simply because of COVID. Even without COVID, those are the ideal fastest things you can, you can get in and extremely rare that you can get one start to finish in 150 days. It's possible, but very rare. Okay, well, first question. Can we have different rules for tenants than what we had for owners? Uh, for example, whether a tenant can own a pet um, or not, or not keep a pet in the building. Um, no. <laughs> you want me to expand down on that? I can. Your your job is not to govern what tenants can and can't do, unless you have a leasing restriction, and even then, that's just whether owners can lease. Yeah. Tenants, I, I don't want to say this the bad way, but tenants don't exist when you're on the board of directors for an HOA. You deal with the members, you deal with the owners. If an owner rents their unit out, you don't find the owner, you don't, I mean, I'm sorry, you don't find the tenant, you don't suspend the privileges of the tenant. You, sus you find the owner and you suspend the privileges of the owner. The rules need to be uniform regardless if it's an owner-occupied unit or a tenant-occupied unit. The rules have to be the same for everybody. 
Now, the only exception to that is if you have a situation where you have an FHA, perhaps an emotional support animal or something like that. Okay, a little bit different, but it's just talking generic. Can you make different rules for tenants? No. Now, you mentioned on the onset, if your, rule, if your covenants allow it, um, there is some ability to adopt certain types of rules that govern tenants. If, you, if your documents allow it, yes, but understand you treat every tenant then the same as you would, and, you know, and as you would like you're treating all the owners the same, you got to treat all the tenants the same. Um, and I find rules like that are just fraught with peril. Uh, your, job, your job is to enforce restrictions against your members, the members are the owners. So our, our condominium association has incurred legal cost to defend against a homeowner dispute. How much can we share with the other owners to be fully transparent since those costs have been put to the condominium budget? How much can you share? Well, about the lawsuit itself, it's public knowledge. Uh, so the lawsuit itself, the contents of it and everything, you can certainly talk about what's, you know, I would advise you not to talk about attorney-client uh, information, um, strategy, things like that. As far as costs, my opinion on that is having gone through a lawsuit where my HOA sued somebody um, and we were getting questions about cost. Everyone pays assessments, they're entitled to know what you're spending. You, you adopt the budget, you work it into the budget. If the costs are higher than that, and people want to know where you're paying it from, I think they're entitled to know that. Um, and they have the right to know. It. Now, I wouldn't publish it as you know, Jenny sued the association and she's costing us $80,000. Now, I wouldn't phrase it like that, but I would say this, Jenny filed a lawsuit against the association on these issues and it's costing us X amount of money to defend. So, and you mentioned attorney-client privilege. So, um, items that are still being negotiated, items that are you know, strategized, things that if the suit is not finalized, you obviously don't want to share any information about. Correct. And, and, and if you're, you're in a situation where you have a member meeting and, they, and members want to know what's going on, the answer is we're in, we're in settlement discussions or we are pending discovery or we are pending motions. The crux of the lawsuit is A, B and C. This is what it's about. This is what we filed and move on. That's it. Um, I, I, we're talking about cost is one thing. We're talking about what's going on with the lawsuit. Be very careful what you divulge. Be very careful. Okay, this is an, another issue question that affects many association. Apathy is is regular in <laughs> in many communities. Yep. Um, so, do votes not cast have to be counted against the particular vote? Yes. A non-vote is a no. Whatever it is, and and in order to take action. In a, in a planned community, in any nonprofit corporation, in a condominium. You have to have the affirmative vote of a percentage of members to take that action, whether it's a majority after a meeting is called where a quorum is present, or whether it's, for example, to amend your documents. In North Carolina, you need 67% and a minimum of everybody. That means you need 67% being yes. If it's a no or it is a non-vote, it's a no. I, I can't really can't say any plan. So and I'll say we've had some communities try and get creative where they say failure to return this ballot will constitute a yes. <laughs> so, yeah, but, I, I've had I have a board uh, that I think you are aware of that said basically that, you know, response means that you're in favor. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's got to be an affirmative yes to take action. Yes. So in North Carolina, if you change your rules and regulations to add new paint colors or changing the wording to a specific rule, we don't need to record these in the county. If you're changing a rule or a guide, architectural guideline that is not in your restrictions, that is correct. In North Carolina, they are not required to be recorded unless the declaration itself requires. And I know of a couple of declarations where the initial rules and regulations were attached as an exhibit. And there was a specific process for amending and a specific process for, for enforcing those rules. Absent that, that is correct. You do not need to record those in North Carolina. Do you have any publishing recommendations 
um, about how to help make those rules more enforceable? Website, newsletters, email blasts. Um, you know, I, I, routinely I'll get questions of prior boards didn't enforce this for the last 10 years. What do we do? Well, if you want to start enforcing it, you got to put everybody on notice and give everybody plenty of time to digest it. And I can't even guarantee then if it's a challenge, you'll, you'll win. But the more communication and advance and enforcement you give, the more reasonable it will look when you go to enforce. Um, modes of publication or any mode necessary. In South Carolina, there are specific requirements on how to publish rule changes to the membership before they can be adopted and then recorded. Um, they can be posted at a public place near the clubhouse, for example, or, but it, and, and I, you know, I don't have the statute in front of me, but I, there's other methods, for example, mailing them out, uh, posting them on a website, on a common forum, et cetera. So South Carolina has specific methods on publishing these rules to the membership before they're adopted, before they're considered for adopted and then before recording. In North Carolina, unless the documents require some sort of method, there's no set way. Okay. Can you clar uh, clarify the pre and post 9986, it's really 86 Condo Act amending um, the declarations sure. in North Carolina? So in North Carolina, if you are a townhome community or single family community, um, in other words, not a condo, the amendment provision of the North Carolina Plan Community Act 47F2117 applies to you, regardless of when you were formed, unless there is language in your declaration that specifically says that that section of the Plan Community Act does not apply to you. I've never seen that language in any declaration, and I don't think I ever will. Because any, any plan community formed after January 1, 1999 is subject to the act. Any, uh, any uh, community formed prior to January 1, 1999, I've never seen anybody amend their documents to say the Plan Community Act does not apply. So that section applies to everybody unless there's specific language that says it does not. As for condominiums, if you are a formed after October 1, 1986, same amendment provision apply, apply 67% or whatever higher percentages in the declaration. If you are a pre October 1, 1986 condominium, that statute, that section of the condominium act does not, is not retroactive to you. I don't know why that is. The legislature has never explained that. And you can look that up. It's at 47C1-102. That is the applicability section of the condo act. What that means is if you are a pre October 1, 1986 condominium, the language in your condominium documents that describes how amendment can be passed is what you must follow. If it is a majority to pass it, then it's a majority. That's really the difference. Okay. Um, can fines and suspension um, activities be part of the rules and regulation document? In South Carolina? I'd say in both, and I think this may be, you know, we could maybe ask a two-part question. Um, should there be a separate fine and suspension resolution adopted, or would you combine that with your rules and regulations document? Um, I don't think there's any one set way to do it. The more formality that is behind the enforcement of any fine or, excuse me, extension, uh, suspension of privileges, the better. Um, in North Carolina, as I indicated, there's a statutory process set in place. So if your documents are silent, you can follow that process and you are, and you are fine. There is no requirement in that process for you to publish anything, for you to adopt separate resolutions. At the same time, what I kind of tried to portray to everybody here today is the more reasonable you look, the easier it is to win if you're challenged. Um, so if you have a process uh, for example, a fine schedule or a, uh, for example, a trash can is going to be $5 for the first violation and 10 for the second and so on. Um, putting that out to the membership, you know, sort of a resolution form or something is perfectly acceptable. And again, bodes well for the association. In South Carolina, I think you'd have a problem starting a fine process 
in your rules and regulations. It's not in your restrictions. And the reasoning for that is restrictions, amending your restrictions, everyone in the world is on notice of it and agrees to it. Big difference. And so, uh, for the South Carolina process to amend your rules, the board can publish the proposed rules. So we're going to start finding, and this is the process. We're going to have a hearing first, and then we're going to find, or we're going to suspend privileges. They can publish that to the membership. The membership then has the opportunity to comment on it, but then the board votes and it's passed and then they record it. That's a little different than amending your restrictions where all the members have a say. So I think that is a, if that's an aggressive way to do it in South Carolina and I would not advise that because I cannot guarantee that a court would agree with that process. If you wish to, if you don't have a fine process in your documents, in South Carolina, and you wish to you wish to do one, you're going to need to. In my opinion, my opinion would be amend your restrictions. And if you have apathy to that, then people who are complaining about the guy who leaves his trash can out for five days every week, the response to that is, well, no one voted to amend to find the guy, so we'd have to sue him, and no one wants to spend twenty thousand dollars just to make a, a guy bring his trash can. That's the practical application of that analysis okay well next question we we are a new development only about 20 percent complete what is the financial responsibility of the developer in terms of landscaping repairs maintenance uh, on on the two buildings that currently exist wow all right well that wow that, that, that's, that's probably a that's, webinar unto itself that's a <laughs> webinar of itself so the one minute quick and dirty is except uh the the developer is to use association assessments to do perform maintenance on those areas as any HOA member control board would. The, the developer is to set the assessments uh, enough and collect enough that uh, to make, uh, to, to be able to budget and, and pay for that. Uh, most documents contain a provision where that the developer will uh, cover any shortfall in the budget over the, over the year. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, he, when he developer transitions away, he must leave the property in a state of good repair. And if he does not, uh, he must either provide funds to the association to bring it into good repair or come in there and put it in good repair. There is case law on that in both states. That yeah. is a quick and dirty because that I, I can go an hour on that. So, yeah. so I'll just say that the developer is wearing two hats. One is the board member yes. and then also the developer or declarant. So and, and you hope those lines don't get blurred, but they do. E easily, but yes. yeah, maybe a, another webinar in the future on, on sure. the developer transition. Yeah. Um, in self-help issues, does an HOA have the authority to require townhome owner to make exterior repairs prior to a scheduled painting or should the association handle those repairs and bill back to the owner? This is assuming that the association is required, is the required party to maintain the exteriors. Assuming that is true, my opinion is for the association to make the repairs, the question, and then to do the painting, the question is, are the repairs to be made, be made something that the association should have been doing all along since it is in charge of the exterior maintenance? If it's not, if it was damage caused by the, by the owner, then yes, it should make the repairs and assess the owner. There's provision in the North Carolina Plan Community Act 47F3115. Three something, something uh, that, that, that allows for that. Okay. I, I'll just, you, you mentioned self-help earlier, but self-help is sometimes frowned upon highly, but it's a do self-help. But, that, but I, I, don't, I don't consider that self-help because the association has the authority uh, and a responsibility to maintain the exteriors. If you as an owner have done something that causes the association to, to expend more funds to perform its routine maintenance, then that's not self-help, that's performing the maintenance and charging back to you because you were negligent. Yep. So does a lien increase in value as the owner owes more assessments or is it static when placed? The lien in North Carolina, the way I draft mine and the way everybody I think drafts theirs is the lien secures the amount due when the lien is filed 
and all sums coming due until either it is paid or the foreclosure is complete. So to say it increases in value, I guess the answer is yes. I wouldn't term it like that, but yes. Okay, this next question, we did do a, a whole webinar on bankruptcy. And so- um, I am not a bankruptcy attorney, folks. I know a little bit, probably enough to make me dangerous. Um, I know enough, but if it's a specific bankruptcy question, I'm gonna have to cede that to somebody else, but I'll see okay. what I can do. But when, and this is a very general question about, can you talk about bankruptcy, bankruptcy filing changes in the collection process? And so I'm guessing that how, how um, the question is more relevant for what happens in the collection process um, if a bankruptcy is filed. So it depends on when it's filed. If, if the bankruptcy is filed prior to your lien being filed, you are an unsecured creditor. And for example, if someone files chapter 13, uh, which is where somebody is required to pay off debts over, over a period of five years, generally, could be seven years. Uh, you become an unsecured creditor and you will likely, if you get paid anything, it will be pennies on the dollar. When I say secure, what I mean by security is when you file a lien for delinquent assessments, you now, your position on who gets, when you get paid is what they're called secured or is set. So for example, if you have a mortgage, they're probably ahead of you in lien position as an HOA. Someone comes in, they buy the house, they got a mortgage. We're going to be behind the mortgage in lien position, but we can be second. We only can be second if we put the lien on, the lien secures our position. The difference in bankruptcy court between an unsecured creditor, someone with no lien, and someone who is a secured creditor who has a lien is you have a tendency to get paid more. Practically speaking, again, all collection activity must stop. So if we've not put a lien on and they file bankruptcy, we can't then go put the lien on. That's collection activity. We can request relief from stay, but I will tell you um, they are a lot harder to get. Uh, if you're not secure. So my advice always is the moment someone goes delinquent, get the lien process started because if they file bankruptcy and you're not secure, you're not going to get a dime and it's going to be very tough to collect anything. And it's going to be very tough to get relief from stay. On the other hand, if you have a lien and you are secure, um, many times we work out an agreement with the bankruptcy attorney to get paid outside of the plan. Um, mortgage, uh, you know, banks do the same thing. We, we generally try to get that accomplished and get some money flowing into the association. Um, what I also see management companies do is, let's say the bankruptcy is filed today. So anything prior to today, they have one ledger and then they start a new ledger. It's called post petition. And the idea behind that is, is if they go through the whole bankruptcy, that pre-petition amount is gone. It's discharged if, they, if it gets discharged. If the bankruptcy is not dismissed beforehand, that money is basically written off after five years uh, or whenever the discharge is. But the money that is accruing post petition, we can work out, get paid during while the during the bankruptcy while it's going on. And if they're not paying, we can request relief from the state to get paid at least on the post petition amount while the bankruptcy is pending. So it's a it's it's a complicated process. Uh, bankruptcy tends to make things complicated, um, but that's kind of the synopsis. Yes, and it delays everything significantly. It does. It can, and it, as you mentioned, up to five years. Yes. <laughs> so, um, if, if a town homeowner has a family member living in their basement with outside access, is the HOA obligated to provide access to the basement along the common property? So I'm guessing there's a walkway around the back that would come through common property. So um, you know, are they obligated to, well, I would say no. <laughs> so. But I don't know what the obligation would be one way or the, like for that. At the same time, if it's simply a walkway and access and it's common area, I mean, if it's gated, I guess, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there an obligation to allow non-members access will know. So I can tell you, I just attended a law seminar and um, 
accessory dwelling units are becoming very popular and mm. zoning is changing a, around the country and they're mm -hmm. allowing different buildings to and they're not subdividing parcels but they're allowing homes to be built within the parcel so you have two homes within an association mm -hmm. or within a lot and so there's a lot of discussion about how to regulate those are they members of the association are they additional unit or do they pay assessments? So there's there's probably a lot to come on that topic. And over the that, next, that sounds like it's going to be a hot button in the coming years. Yes. And you're definitely seeing it in more municipal areas or downtown you know, um, urban areas where you know, density is, is being pushed. Ben, uh, I noted it's 555. Um, you want to go four more minutes? We have a few fine. questions. So sure. we'll do a hard stop at six and get through as many of these. So talk quick. Folks, if you want to if you want to ask a specific question that we don't get to, uh, can they email you guys and you can get them to me? Yep. We can okay, great. Those. So we have a member who is going to build a pool and he's over his impervious area for his lot. The ARC request has been denied, but he intends to build it anyway. Um, this is a North Carolina community. Yes. What's the question? Well, <laughs> Actually, what can you do? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> okay, so he intends to build who's, who's it. Who's at risk? Who's at risk? All right, so uh, impervious. I, I learned a lot in the last couple of years about impervious land. Um, if he's over it and and, and, and the architect, this is actually just an architectural question because if the architectural committee can deny based upon going over the, the plans, will put him over his impervious allotment, then it can deny the plans, and if he builds. If he starts to build, he, threatening to build is not built. Okay, so if he's not, if he's just saying I'm going to build it anyway, okay, well, fine. That's just what you're saying. But if he starts, then you have the decision to make as to whether you're going to fine, call into a hearing and fine, or you're going to pursue injunctive relief. Now, with impervious. Because the local watershed jurisdictions could be Mecklenburg County, could be Cornelius, could be Davidson, I don't know where you are, um, or Huntersville. Um, the county may get involved with that too, uh, if you can put them on alert, uh, because they, they take that stuff pretty seriously. But from an HOA perspective, someone is threatening to build something without approval is not the same as building it without approval. So keep that in mind. And the other thing I think around impervious restrictions is that's largely a developer issue um, in the mm -hmm. development process. And impervious isn't often even mentioned within your governing documents. And so right. there, there's, you know, depending on how that is, but a lot, a lot of information. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more information I really need to on that yeah. one. Um, if a foreclosure is executed and the HOA filed the foreclosure and it's awarded, who actually owns the property? assuming there is no outstanding mortgage? Assuming that there is no outside bidder at the foreclosure sale, then the property then becomes the uh, part of the association. The association becomes the owner of both states. Okay. If there's no mortgage, then the association has itself a piece of property that it can sell for whatever it wants, whatever the market will allow, or it can rent it out if it's rentable. And rarely will you find yourself at the courthouse um, with equity in a home where somebody is not yeah. outbidding you on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that is, I know one town home association that used one unit that they foreclosed on uh, as a clubhouse for a year until the bank took it. Um, and I know another that, they, that there was no mortgage on they foreclosed on and they actually sold it to an owner. Um, and for some reason, they only sold it to the owner for what was owed in the assessments, even though they didn't have to do that. Once you own it, you can sell it for whatever you can get for it. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you were owed, because the debt is wiped out when the foreclosure is complete. So I'm going to do one last question, okay. even though there are a few left. But um, how do you feel about working out payment plans for delinquent homeowners? My personal opinion is I despise them because they muddy up the works and the timing and more than half will make a down payment and then default on the plan. However, they are a necessary evil. The, for the, from the association perspective, it is 
my opinion, it is better to get money coming in than to sit there and pursue a foreclosure and potentially get nothing if and then accept a piece of property that has a mortgage on it. Um, I encourage my boards to work out payment plans if possible. I ask the boards to allow me to set the parameters, at least initially, um, and they go with that. Um, payment plans, in my opinion, uh, should be a half down minimum with a three month payoff. Anything longer than that, you risk, it, it, it's just, it's statistically, if it goes longer than three months, your chance of getting paid drops significantly. But they are a necessary evil that, I, you know, while I don't like them, they're needed. Okay, I said last question, but I'm gonna ask one last question because it's really the okay. last question. We have ve vehicles with expired tags parked around our community. Um, we have nothing in our CCRs that state your vehicles need to be registered, but can we have these vehicles towed? Ben, I can't answer that question without knowing more like whether these are public or private well, roads. And, 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 you know, I yeah. believe these are private roads if I'm remembering correctly. Um, private. They are private. Okay. Yes, I believe Let, let me just private. say this. <laughs> Let me just say this. If you if your CCR say nothing, then you can't do anything. You can't tell them. You can't find them. Nothing. I'll stop there. <laughs> but now, these are private roads, and so they would likely be common property. Uh, can the board adopt rules and regulations around? No, the, the board property? can adopt rules. It says you have, if you're going to park on the private roads, you have to have your vehicle registered. And the most that I would say you would do then is if you find out that there's an unregistered vehicle parked on the road and you know who owns it, you can you can call them to a hearing and potentially find them. But I would not recommend towing without it being in a restriction. Okay. okay. I'm just conservative in that matter simply because. <laughs> Heaven, heaven forbid you got somebody, you scratch somebody's Porsche bumper and watch out, you're going to get sued. And I'd rather at least, if I'm going to defend that, I'd rather point to restriction than all. Yep. I understand. Well, Chris, thank you for your time. Everybody who's still with us, thank you for, for staying um, an extra 30 minutes. So sure. we do enjoy doing these and we really appreciate y'all's participation. So um, as Chris mentioned, if, if you do have questions and you want to, um, you know, we'll, we'll try and bounce some ideas off um, him and me as well, if you have any other questions, but we can certainly um, get you next time. So these are held well, the third, third Thursday of the month. I'll say that Ben went to the law seminar, so he, he may know as much as I do. So Absolutely. He may know more. So. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. And good